Hi everybody, welcome to another video of Quarantine. I'm Mitch and I use he, him, his pronouns. And here is another untraditional video for untraditional times. I wanted to uh, wish everyone a happy Hanukkah. Last night was the first night and I hope that you are still able to find the same peace and joy and fun in your celebrations, even while they're not looking the way perhaps we are used to them too. I know for me on my end, uh, hanging out with things that were very nostalgic and very traditional has been really comforting to me. So that's why I dug out this book. I have had this since it was published in 2003 and it looks like just another chicken soup for the soul book, but this is actually an advent calendar, which counts down the days till Christmas with a story for every day. And I have been reading this to myself and sometimes to my wife as we are getting closer to the Christmas holiday, but I realized that I wasn't really seeing stories in it or in any of the chicken soup for the soul books that I remember reading that kind of reflected the experiences that I've had. And so I got the idea to kind of scour the internet and try to find some stories about coming out around the holidays to kind of create a little bit of a chicken soup for the LGBTQ soul. So I'm here in front of my electric fireplace with my transgender and my cozy sweater, and I'm going to read you some stories. Here we go. One of my friends got the idea to be my date to Thanksgiving dinner so that my family wouldn't bug me so much about finding a girlfriend. She knew I was gay and knew I hadn't told them. So we go. She is my date, gives me hugs, a little smooch on the cheek, sold. Then I see this look in my grandmother's face at dinner. It hurt. It hurt to see her beaming over something that was a lie. I felt horrible, like I wanted to go crawl into the oven and die next to the turkey. It comes as a surprise to many people, but I practically never lie to my family. For some reason at the table, my grandpa decided that I should lead Grace. I don't know if it was just because my head was stuck or what, but I just went, I'm gay, and a river of tears and snot came out of my face, so I went and locked myself in my room. About an hour goes by and the house is dead quiet. My dad unlocks the door and in comes both my grandmothers. They both just hug me and tell me they love me just the way I am. I thought I'd died. My friend sheepishly came into the room and handed me a plate of food. She told me my parents said I can take all the time I need to calm myself and then come back and celebrate. They treated it like it was the best thing since sliced bread and I had nearly peed my pants. So this next one um, I think is really important to share. It does talk about the HIV AIDS epidemic, so it is a little bit triggering and it references death. Um, so just a warning as we head into this next story. I came of age and came out of the closet during the decade of decadence. Yes, the 1980s. Cocaine, credit cards, bathhouses, designer jeans, Reagan, the gay cancer, the gay men's health crisis, act up, fear, persecution, death, and more death, followed by more death, some more fear, and countless funerals that added up so quickly that most of the gay men I knew felt guilty to be alive. By 1988, we were so paralyzed by fear and guilt and numbed by cocaine and alcohol that it took us some years to realize that our communities, our country, our government, our president, and in many cases, even our families had abandoned us because they assumed we would be dead soon anyway. By the end of the decade, more of the gay men I knew were counting Christmases than were not. Counting Christmases was a phrase my friends and I would use to differentiate between the people we knew that had HIV AIDS and those of us that were merely waiting to get it. You see, from what we observed, from the time in between when someone became sick from HIV to the time that they died, you could count two Christmases. It was very late in the decade when I got the news that I had two Christmases left. I was in the middle of graduating from college, trying to make decisions about what I wanted to do with my life, 
in trying to find first and then explore every back alley gay club I heard about when I had to break the news to my family that I was counting Christmases too. I thought to myself, I don't have time for this. Just locating the gay clubs was a full-time job because none of them had signs in front of them. Randomly figuring out which unmarked, dusty back alley inner city door had a fabulous gay emerald city behind it was no easy task, and now I only had two years left to find every one of them in the world. So my coming out story never truly happened. I am sure there was a huge amount of screaming clues and screaming queens around me that my parents had to suspect I was gay anyway, so I skipped talking with them at the time about my sexuality and merely announced during a family dinner one Friday night that I was counting Christmases. My mother's first reaction is going to seem cold to you, maybe even crass or self-centered, but don't dwell on it. Her response was fairly typical for near the end of the 1980s, when admitted out loud or not, most of us were more focused directly on ourselves and how and if we would survive until the cavalry, the 1990s, arrived than we were on anything else. So she turned to my father and said, rather indignantly and with more than a little disgust, I told you this was going to happen. And that was it. That was the extent of the discussion, mostly. We went back to acting like we were a family that was above having any kind of problems and pretended that it wasn't happening. The 1990s arrived with many a year's long haze and my family turned on. The people I knew were continuing to die and I was just waiting to, but before I knew it, 1997 rolled around and something in my body that no one could explain had kept me alive until breakthrough medicines were discovered and dispensed that offered those of us with HIV AIDS a new beginning and many more Christmases. Those of us who navigated this 15 years in history the best we knew how at the time were extremely lucky, but there was a cost to us, a loss, what feels like a great amount of wasted time. Every generation will indeed have its plight, but I encourage the young people of today to find a way to embrace the fact that they are living in the best time in history to be exactly who they are openly and as early as they become comfortable in their skin. I encourage you to take full advantage of this. Stand up, be exactly who you are and who you want to be, come out to the world because even though the current world is not without its problems, I promise you that there will be what feels like a huge coming out party awaiting you and that you will feel exponentially more alive when you live your authentic life out of the darkness and in the light where the world can see exactly how beautiful you are. To celebrate Hanukkah today is thus a form of coming out, admitting difference, recognizing that one is not the same as everyone else, and hopefully celebrating the unique gifts that being different offers. But coming out is not easy. Here, my own story may be instructive. I sort of knew I was gay at 18, definitely knew at 23, but didn't come out until age 30 when a wonderful woman I had been dating finally dumped me, good for her, and I realized I couldn't make it work as a bisexual because that wasn't who I was. Why? What took me so long? I'm an intelligent, reasonably sensitive, and courageous guy. Why did I spend 10 years hating myself, repressing my deepest desires, and failing to embrace the gifts of emotional and sexual fulfillment? As we celebrate this coming out holiday and as encouragement to those still hesitating whether to come out themselves, whether in regards to their sexual orientation, their religion, or in any other way, I offer the following reasons. First, I didn't know what I was missing. I had no idea how dead I was inside, how emotionally cut off I was from other people, or what love really was about. My friends will tell you I was a different person entirely, more sarcastic, more insular, less open, less honest. Try it yourself. If you lie to everyone you know about what's most important to you, you'll see what happens. And if you've been doing it yourself, please take the leap of faith. It's way, way better on this side of the chasm, trust me. Oh, and by the way, I hate the sin, love the sinner doesn't work. Sexual orientation, like religious orientation, isn't a part-time hobby. If you hate the sin, you're going to end up hating yourself. Second, and relatedly, I thought that coming out would destroy everything I valued. I thought it would end my Jewish religious life, end my chances at normalcy, and alienate me from family and friends. 
I was wrong on all counts. My spiritual and religious life blossomed once I stopped hating God for making me gay. I was able to start thinking about having a real life, a family, and a career only after I stopped having fake ones. And my being honest about myself has enabled me to forge friendships that are deeper than I had ever imagined back in the closet. Closet is probably too cozy a word for me. Tomb or trap or web of lies is better. I have also watched my family members evolve in their own views and come not only to accept my sexuality, but also to embrace it. A tall order to be sure, especially as they themselves still encounter homophobia from their friends. But what mother doesn't want her son to be happy? Eventually, we learn that love, happiness, justice, and holiness are all that matters. And if homosexuality, heterosexuality, or bisexuality leads to those things, Baruch Hashem. Finally, I think it took me so long to come out because I lacked the kind of community and values that would have given me the courage I needed to do so. All my friends and family members were straight, and the gay world I saw on TV looked superficial, hypersexual, and weird. It was only once I came out that I realized that sexual orientation is about more than having sex, and that being queer, like being Jewish, is a blessing. In an ideal world, we all grow up with religious and personal role models. But because few LGBT people grow up in gay families, coming out can be lonely, terrifying, and embarrassing. Yet, it is also the Jewish thing to do. It may be hard to be a Jew on Christmas, but it's by daring to do so that we've survived the past 3,000 years and created a culture and religion worth preserving. Well before the Maccabees, the very first Jew, Abraham, was told by God to come out to get out of his father's house, follow his own spiritual path, and cross over to the other side of the river. From this act, our nation and language gets the name Hebrew, the one who crosses over. And from Abraham's repeated answers to God's queries, we get the consummate statement of self-exposure, here I am. The lessons of coming out are Jewish lessons. Just like repressed gay people, repressed Jews don't know how damaging it is to closet our religious and cultural selves, how invigorating it is to be open, honest, and celebratory about who we are, or how empowering it is to be part of a community of boundary crossers. So, my Hanukkah advice is to stop repressing and stop equivocating. Whatever closet you're hiding in, whether it's sexual, religious, professional, cultural, or just plain dull and repressive, Light the Hanukkah candles, or don't. Celebrate nonconformity, and for God's sake and yours, come out, please, wherever you are. So, I have one more that I found that I really liked. When I was 12, I was given the book Chicken Soup for the Preteen Girl's Soul. Terrified of growing up and confronting the looming threat of womanhood, I poured through the pages. I remember the book had sections dedicated to certain themes. Peer pressure, love, family, death, friends, and more. Each section was prefaced with a small poem and peppered throughout were works of art, usually comics. The meat of the book was stories sent in by girls between 11 and 18. Depending on the age of the author, they were either tales of recently acquired life lessons or reflective accounts of formative memories. In my sixth grade year, I read the book front to back countless times, even flagging my favorite stories with hot pink sticky notes, the color of which matched the font on the cover. I cried reading about a girl whose mother had died, was both terrified and moved by a girl with bulimia's story. Other submissions stuck out to me. One about a girl who started her period, another about a girl who joined the Boy Scouts instead of selling cookies with the Girl Scouts, or the last story of the book, entitled, which featured a young woman and her journey through intense bullying and self-esteem. I had a diverse collection of voices of young women at my disposal, and as I read their words, I still wondered where I would fit in within the mosaic of girlhood. I fantasized about eventually submitting my own piece to a future edition of the book, at the end of my story, there would be my first name starting with K, italicized like all the others. Yet I ruminated with a sort of detachment. My fantasies were really just fantasies. In reality, I had no idea how I felt about living life as a girl. 
The more I thought about it, the more confused I became. In questioning what kind of woman I would become, I was also faced with the question of being a woman in general. For the first time, I had to consider how I felt about being a girl, and I didn't have the answer to what should have been an obvious question. If I was born this way, there shouldn't be a problem, right? At this time, this was just an unease I couldn't put a name to, and I chalked it up to my aforementioned fear of entering my teens and getting on with life past childhood. Looking back, however, it's clear to me now that this was a precursor to a much larger identity crisis. Fast forward through more confusion, and I eventually joined Tumblr at 13, melted into the community of Glee fans, and was exposed to an iteration of the queer community for the first time. One blogger who was a masculine lesbian who received questions about their gender, pronouns, and unisex nickname. I gathered my courage and sent them a message stating how I loved their blog and voiced my confusion about my gender identity to another human being for the first time ever. I said I wanted to start presenting more masculine, but I was unsure of how to go about it. The blogger was kind, saying they'd been buying men's clothes exclusively for a while, and there was nothing wrong about me for wanting to try it out. So naturally, I started secretly identifying as a lesbian. Off the computer, I was wearing the same pair of green cargo pants from Goodwill every other day because they were the only masculine piece of clothing I owned. One day, I tentatively googled transgender, what is transgender, etc. My most vivid memory is seeing the definition of pangender, an identity which fluctuates between multiple genders. This seemed to line up with my bouncing back and forth from being a girl to becoming masculine, but it still didn't fit. That's when I found the term female to male. Nothing fell into place and everything didn't suddenly make sense, but it felt as if I was starting toward the right direction. I asked my online friends to refer to me with male pronouns, but kept using my birth name, a change I deemed unnecessary, but was actually scared of until a year later. I am 17 now, and the past four years since I first identified as trans have been something as a roller coaster. For a while, my gender identity was tied to my mental health, which had taken many nosedives, rising back up only to plummet yet again. For a long time after I started identifying as trans, I thought I was heterosexual. I also became somewhat hyper-masculine. Both of these struggles were compulsory knee-jerk reactions in an effort to reject the femininity I was trying to untangle myself from and resulted in a lot of internal strife and pain. By trying to fit into the mold of the perfect masculine straight boy, I thought I could make up for not being cisgender. I never gave myself the chance to explore the other facets of my identity, so I found myself subconsciously repressing some things I did not want to have to face. I was extremely insecure with my gender identity and myself as a whole. While I was overcompensating for being trans, I was also scared I wasn't trans enough. Because I didn't even think about my gender identity until I was 13, I thought something was wrong with me. I wasn't allowed to think of myself as a trans boy. In all the articles I had read, it sounded like you were supposed to just know who you are automatically right out of the womb, and that simply wasn't the case for me. Out of place in cisgender society and scared I wouldn't be welcome in the trans community, I became lonely and depressed pretty much all of the time. I'd already begun questioning my sexuality, something which terrified me. I knew deep down that I really liked boys, but I was afraid of being trans and gay. Why me? I sent myself tumbling down a road of self-hate. I hated my gender identity, my sexuality, my appearance, my mental illness, my home, my life, and so much more. You can see where this is leading, or where it could have led. All of my personal doubts and fears could have manifested in disastrous ways, and I admit they occasionally did. In November of 2013, I even went to the emergency room for a psych evaluation, was nearly admitted, and had to write a safety plan at midnight before I left. It wasn't fun. Having to nearly die in order to live wasn't fun. But I wouldn't trade my experiences for anything, and in the end, I regret nothing. Without my pain and suffering, I'd never have the happiness I do today. As I gained more trans friends, I became more comfortable with myself, which gave me the confidence to change my name once and for all. My mom had chosen my birth name, which I inherited from an alien on a Star Trek spinoff, and I wanted something as equally unique. 
I immediately thought of what I consider the rarest letter of the alphabet, X, and naturally chose Xavier. It fit me in a way that only trans people will be able to understand. Choosing a name for yourself that coincides with who you know yourself to be is an act of rebirth and reclamation. Instead of trying to force yourself under a persona, which is the opposite of everything you are comfortable with, you gift yourself a small but invaluable taste of autonomy and control. When you find your name, you just know, and the sensation is indescribable. Typing it out, reading it, and hearing my friends call me by it still fills me with joy. I hope it always will. After choosing my name, everything happened so fast. I was outed the summer before my sophomore year when my sister got a hold of my phone and saw me going by Xavier. For a few years, I was miserable. Nothing seemed to be going right, and I felt like I had no future. But somehow, I kept going. One year after I was outed, my mom and my stepmom got married in Miami. We flew down to Florida for a week, went shopping, swam in the ocean, and spent our evenings balming our pasty Midwestern skin with aloe. Despite all of this fun, I felt detached from everything. I'd been feeling dysphoric for a few weeks, my school year didn't turn out how I'd planned, and I just wanted to be home. For a handful of nights, I distinctly remember crying once everyone was asleep. On the drive back from the Indianapolis airport, I stared out the car window the entire time, wondering why I'd been so desperate to go home. Now that I was back, I felt kind of stupid, but I paid attention to the sunlight and the tall grass flanking the interstate, and when we passed the Illinois border, I welcomed the cornfields with open arms. As we neared my hometown in the heart of Illinois, the familiar highways and green directory signs flashing with a rainbow reflection of the sunset filled me with a beautiful sense of ease. Looking back on the past four years since I started identifying as trans is such a blur. I have overcome so many things I thought impossible. When I was 13, I never thought I'd be writing this or planning my transition or coming out to friends, but these are all things I have accomplished. My freshman year, I thought I'd have taken my own life before I graduated, yet here I am as a soon-to-be senior full of inspiration, hope, and courage, taking steps towards the rest of a long, fulfilling life. I have accepted who I am. I am not only fully queer, but fully here. I have embraced my whole identity. I am not just trans or gay or Xavier, but I am a human being. I have talents, I have potential, I have promise, and I have hope. I want trans people to know that it is okay to be who you are. I want trans people to know that it is okay to be sad and happy and angry and scared and nervous. I want trans people to know that they are beautiful and wonderful and just as important as anyone else. I want trans people to know that it is okay to be trans as well as gay, lesbian, disabled, neurodivergent, asexual, aromantic, or anything at all. I want trans people to know they are more than their identity, but also that your identity is integral to who you are. Without accepting yourself, it's hard to learn to love yourself. It's okay to be who you are, whomever that is. I want trans people to know that it is okay to experience dysphoria and it's okay not to. I want trans people to know it is okay to want surgery or hormones and to not want them. I want trans people to know it is okay to want what they need, whatever that is. More than anything, I want trans people to know that they deserve love and safety and that there is a wonderful community open to them which understands them and will fight for them and listen to them and care for them. So, dear trans reader, know this. There is a chicken soup for the transgender soul. There are sections dedicated to peer pressure, love, family, death, friends, and more with poems and artwork in between. There are stories of trans boys and trans girls and non-binary people and bi-gender people and many others. There are stories of trans love and trans beauty and trans happiness. There are stories of trans sadness and trans struggle and trans pain. These stories are my stories, your stories, and our stories. These stories are in all of us waiting to be written. You are writing your own story and it will be a great one. If you ever feel lost, hopeless, or confused, if you're ever a few seconds from hurting yourself or finally coming out to your family or about to check a different box under gender for the first time, know this. 
When I fantasized about writing for the chicken soup for the preteen girl's soul, I never imagined I'd be writing for the transgender soul instead. But I am, and I will continue to do so, and I hope you do too, because it's about time we get our own chicken soup. We all deserve it. I hope that these have brought you some joy and understanding today. And I hope that you are continuing to find ways to celebrate this year and celebrate the ending of this year in ways that are safe and healthy for you. We are here if you need us at any time during the week and we will be announcing very soon some new programs that are going to be starting in the next year. So please continue to take good care and Enjoy the holiday season for what it is. Bye.